a sentence of introduction, was my colleague. In fact, he came to the office about three months before I left the office at the Office of Special Investigations in the Department of Justice, that office which was between 1978 and 2010 charged with investigating Nazi offenders who came to the United States. Um, he also, uh, because of his German and Russian language skills, uh, took over the balance of uh, the Travniki cases after I left and worked very closely with Judge uh, Kirsten Goetze on the development uh, uh, of the Demyanya case and applying it to a, uh, uh, a slightly different perception under German law. With that, I'd like to go ahead and start with the paper. Accusations of Victor's Justice, the dismissive and implicitly disreputable application of one party's judicial standards to a militarily defeated opponent's leaders and sometimes citizens began with the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals and lasts up until today's work at the International Criminal Court for Yugoslavia and for Rwanda. Indeed, post-hostilities international proceedings have without exception borne this stigma for the last seven decades. The problem of reputedly retributive justice extended likewise to national prosecutions, notably against Nazi-era criminals in the U.S. Army's so-called Dachau trials in 1946-47, and continuing to the Iraqi uh, um, High Tribunal condemnation and execution of Saddam Hussein, a process deeply flawed in the opinion of Western attorneys who participated in the defense. The salient characteristic of proceedings decried as victor's justice is not the quality of the evidence used, the regularity of proceedings, or conditions of interrogations, but the extraordinarily high rates of conviction and application of maximum sentences allowable under the law. Such results have imputed to post-conflict trials a penumbra of non-judicial -jur motivation that the results were preordained by political or ideological necessity, and thus the trials were illegitimate regardless of the quality of the procedures and jurisprudence. The motive of assured punishment of the guilty rather than blind justice has occasionally been explicit. Yet the seeming taint of foreordination has not changed the fact that at least some of these trials were essentially fair and impartial, and that they rose to the high legal ideals of the parties carrying them through. Post-war German national proceedings in so-called national socialist crimes um, NS Gewaltverbrechen, cases have consistently maintained high procedural standards and judicial even-handedness, even as Germany's investigative and prosecutorial commitment displayed decades of complacency, lack of will, and even passivity in the face of clear evidence of criminal complicity in some of the century's worst crimes. In the highly contested area of accountability, the case of Soviet-era trials is a welter of contradictions. During the immediate post-war years, until Stalin's death in the spring of 1953, the USSR identified, interrogated, and convicted hundreds of thousands of its own citizens for their activities during the German occupation, post-44, of Soviet territory, even when those citizens and the territory on which the crimes were committed had not been, quote, Soviet, unquote, until liberation. Yet the state suspended the death sentence soon after the war's end, 
and around 1955, almost all of the convicted perpetrators who had outlived the Stalinist regime received amnesty and were released. Long after most Western states had in effect ceased criminal prosecution for Nazi-era crimes, secret Soviet proceedings continued to hold accountable those who had committed grave offenses during the occupation up to the disintegration of the USSR in 1991. This body of investigative and prosecutorial experience and the laws from which it arose distinguished the Soviet victor's justice from any other expression of accountability on modern record. And that exercise and accountability sprang from the repressive totalitarian legal system that emerged in the USSR as early as the mid-1920s. That system had served as a basis for, the mass, for mass repression on an indefinable scale and was not repealed until 1960. The stunted legal framework in which Soviet criminal justice operated, however, simultaneously defanged retribution while preventing meaningful investigation of Nazi genocidal actions for 15 years. By the late 1940s, application of the law to the judgment of actions by those residing on Soviet territory bore all the hallmarks of everyday law enforcement, but with little consciousness of the actual criminal acts of the perpetrators. By the 1960s, investigations and prosecutions had every appearance of modern criminal law enforcement procedures and the specific acts of the accused leap from the pages of interrogations and trial transcripts. Murder was simply murder. But this system was hardly a Soviet version of the electrifying prosecution of the perpetrators of modern history's greatest genocide. Eichmann in Dnepropetrovsk this was not. In the paper, I will trace the evolution of the Soviet state's pursuit of a category of wartime perpetrator for whom there can be little doubt of objective innocence. The former Soviet soldiers who assisted in the operation of the three Axiom Reinhardt extermination centers on Polish soil, Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka. This cohort comprised of approximately 400 former Red Army servicemen, whom the Wehrmacht had captured between the summer of 1941 and mid-1942. Many subsequently died, either while in German service or towards war's end, but a majority survived the war and in a few cases remained anonymous until the 1970s. Their fates, once in the hands of Soviet investigators, are a precise outline of the evolution of the Soviet criminal justice system from investigation to execution of sentence. Between 1945 and 2005, German state authorities investigated almost 172,300 perpetrators for crimes committed under the Nazi regime. Of these, fewer than 10% were indicted. About 13,900 went to trial. Just 4,666 were convicted, and 70% of those uh, before Stunde Null, the 1949 reestablishment of a sovereign Germany. By contrast, after liberation, the Soviet authorities searched for Soviet citizens, and those whom they defined as citizens for purposes of security, who had cooperated with Germany, German occupation authorities on territory claimed by the USSR. Soviet investigations and prosecutions during the first eight years numbered upwards of a half million, although categorization of cases defies comparison to processes that, processes that occurred in most other countries at least until 1959-1960. Between liberation and Stalin's death, certainly close to 100% of the cases against these enemies of the state fell under the infamous Article 58 series of offenses 
counter-revolutionary activity and its particular specifications. This category included men who had served a, as a German appointed a village elder, a starosta, in central Ukraine, the person who worked on the Reichsbahn in Belarus, or the bookkeeper who worked in a German agricultural office in central Russia. But the criminal complicity of others who worked for German pay was not ambivalent in the least. The so-called Travniki men were one such group. Somewhere between four and 5,000 men and one woman were recruited and trained at Travniki in Lublin Voyevodstvo, then bore arms on behalf of Germany, mostly on the territory of southeastern Poland. These men comprised a guard force and cannot be seen as anything other than collaborators, if only because all were armed and carried out the German security objectives against civilian populations. The guard force included probably 1,500 to 2,000 former Soviet prisoners of war recruited in 1941 and 1942. Some of them, after training at Travniki, deployed to the extermination centers in Belzec's, Sobibor, and Treblinka. Even before peacetime Soviet criminal justice tackled the Travniki men who operated the extermination machinery of Axion Reinhardt, Smersch, the Red Army's <coughs> counterintelligence departments, identified and interrogated at least seven captured by the 65th Army on the first Belarusian front when it swept through the Malkinia area en route to Warsaw. The interrogations took place between August and November 1944, initially coinciding with preliminary Soviet investigation of the crimes at Treblinka. All were tried, convicted, and shot on the basis of Article 1 of Ukaz Number 43 of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. Others, particularly ethnic German former Travniki men, whom the rapidly advanced